Well, welcome everyone. Good to see so many participants in the webinar coming into the webinar now. Uh, an interesting topic for us today for um, CG seminar number 261 since we began on the 12th of November 2015. Doesn't that seem a long time ago? A lot of water has flowed under our bridge and everyone else's. Um, today we have uh, Yujio Kai and uh, Nicola Mountford talking to us about institutional logics analysis in higher education research. Um, before I introduce our speakers properly, let me take you through the webinar protocols. I apologize for those of you who've heard these before, but we do need to um, recycle them each time. Uh, remember that the webinar is being recorded and, and the, um, uh, the full recording will be obtainable on YouTube and through our website into YouTube within 48 hours or so. Uh, we also post the chat, the public part of the chat on our website. Now, during the webinar, please keep yourself muted unless you've been, you're being brought into the discussion during the Q&A section. And there's no need to have your video on either during the webinar, but we recommend that you turn on both your audio and your video when you come into the discussion. We recommend using the speaker view setting so you can more clearly see who is talking. Now, to ask a question or to make a statement in response to the speakers, use the chat function. That's how you signal that you would like to come into the webinar in the Q&A section. Uh, um, and um, once we've finished the speaking part, which usually takes the first half of the webinar, and we begin the q and I'll give you a warning when we want to bring you in to the discussion, I'll write to you in the chat. Um, now, when you're invited into the Q&A, uh, please, of course, unmute yourself, as I said, and switch on your video, and then state your name and where you are from. Well, it's a pleasure to introduce our speakers. Dr. Yushio Kai is a senior lecturer and adjunct professor at the Higher Education Group, HEG, Faculty of Management and Business at Tampere University in Finland, and he's co-editor-in-chief of the Triple Helix Journal, a very, a very well-published scholar, uh, and many of you will know of his work. Nicola Mountford, assistant professor at Maynooth University School of Business. Maynooth is on the edge of Dublin. And Nicola's uh, research interest is in how governments and other market actors can together find an optimum balance between the efficiency of a market and the social responsibilities of a state. Don't we all need to go there? We might also add in global responsibilities as well. Um, Nicola publishes in journals such as Organisational Studies, Journal of Business Research and Studies in Higher Education. Uh, pleasure at this point to hand over to our speakers and we'll begin with Yuzio. Thank you, Simon, for the introduction. Please give me a second to upload my slide here. And we can see okay, that. So, excellent. Thank you again, uh, Simon, for the introduction and also for the uh, invitation. So it's a really our great honor to be here uh, in the webinar to share our recent study on institutional logics analysis in higher education research. Our talk is mainly based on our recent uh, publication publication in studies in higher education. Our research actually is a really a long process. I, I still remind, remember when we initially developed the idea uh, for examining institutional logics in the field of specific sectors. That was already five years ago in 2016, when we were in the new institutionalism workshop in Lucerne, Switzerland. Our early research funding uh, were first presented in the 2019 New Institutionalism Workshop in Uppsala, Sweden. Then it took us another two years to 
to revise and finalize our paper, eventually being published. So now I'm very happy to share the research findings of our research uh, took a long journey. Our research responses to a research challenge uh, that is where institutional logic theory has been increasingly being applied in higher education research, especially in the recent years. Agreement is lacking on how to approach institutional logics analysis. This results in a proliferating institutional logics in higher education studies. And this situation often confuses newcomers to the field as to how to use institutional logics in their empirical research. So as a response to the research challenge, uh, we answer four research questions as listed on the slides through a systematic literature analysis. In our presentation, we will mainly cover three issues. First, I will invite my colleague, Nicola Montfort, to give a brief introduction to institutional logic theory. Then I will present our major findings on the use of institutional logics in higher education research. Finally, uh, Nicola will give our suggestions on how to improve institutional logics analysis in higher education research. Now I give the floor to my colleague, Nicola, uh, over to you. So I will uh, change the slides for you. Thanks, Yuzhou. Um, yeah, so you can go on to the next slide. So I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about institutional logics theory. So I understand that we're a group of higher education researchers. So on that basis, not everybody will be familiar with institutional theory. So um, just a quick sort of introduction to it. Um, so institutional theory, I suppose, is, is about how we socially construct um, organizations, societies, even individual identities, and how that happens over time, and the kind of the the I suppose the the social formats um, that that creates, um, and how that might either constrain or enable uh, action um, from individual actors or organizational actors within a field or within society. And there's many streams and strands to institutional theory from old institutionalism, which was very much about the institutions themselves, and um, new institutionalism, which starts to look at you know, actors and the relationships between actors. And then we have things about how we change or maintain institutions, looking at institutional entrepreneurship, institutional work, and so on. But what we're really interested in today is this idea of institutional logic. So let's look at that in a little more detail. And if you're interested in the other elements and particularly how they apply to higher education, you can always look at you, Joe's paper um, from 2015 and get more detail there. So in institutional logic, then I'm going to uh, uh, take Friedland and Alford's uh, definition um, as the originators really of the institutional logics approach. So it's a set of material practices and symbolic constructions. And this idea of the material and the symbolic coming together is very important. Um, and together, these kind of form an organizing principle. So they start to structure uh, the way people organize themselves. Um, and uh, they're still available to elaborate, right? So they can still kind of um, evolve and change over time. And there's quite a few different uh, sort of inputs into the development of this institutional uh, logics approach over time, starting with uh, Friedland and Alfred, and then uh, Thornton and her colleagues really uh, feeding into this and developing the concept in more detail. So we now have really eight uh, possibly seven, we'll discuss that later perhaps, and um, uh, kind of classic formulations of the institutional logics at the societal level. So initially there were five identified by Alfred and Freeland, then six as Thornton came in and, and then Thornton um, and colleagues in 2012 identified seven logics. They did, they excluded the democracy logic um, that uh, Freeland and Alfred had at the outset. But so we're going to just you know, take the eight for granted for the moment and say that, uh, that these eight down the left hand side of the slide are the kind of the key um, uh, societal level logics. And I think, 
you know, any of us who have worked in or done research on higher education will immediately start to see that some of these logics um, ring bells, right? That we can see that the state might be more or less prevalent as a logic in the higher education. You know, we, we are all aware of the increasing um, drive towards a market logic. You know, the profession is obviously important for all of us um, as individuals. And you can see how some of the others might also um, be present. So when we go to look at higher education, then as, as researchers, we can already see how the institutional logics approach, how those logics are prevalent. But why do we like what, what can this do for us? What does it help? Um, how does it help us as researchers? Well, in the first instance, it really helps us to um, to concretize, <laughs> if there is such a word, the concept of the institution. So, you know, the institution itself is relatively abstract, right? But when we start to look at logics, then we start to see patterns and we start to see these material and symbolic constructions. So it's easier for us to understand the meaning um, that underpins particular actions or particular conflicts when we take an institutional logics approach. And that means that it becomes very, very useful when we start to look at very complex institutional environments. So when we start to look at um, environments where there may be multiple logics um, interacting on a horizontal level, and perhaps even multiple influences coming down from a societal field organizational level um, on a kind of a vertical axis, we can have very complex environments, right? And if we try to um, understand those environments, institutional logics can help because we can start to understand well that you know maybe societal logics might might be slightly different from those at a field level or those that are, are even experienced at an organizational level and that maybe there's multiple logics or conflicting logics within one organization within one field and definitely within society and um, and then that helps us then to sort of understand this paradox of embedded agency so the embedded agency is the idea that institutions constrain. So they provide kind of uh, social formats within which our actions are sort of organized and constrained. However, we all know that things change, right? So even when I was talking earlier about the idea of market logics coming into higher education, that's change. So people can make decisions that go against a logic or that change a logic or that seek to change a logic. So so institutional logics, or sorry, institutions, I said to change institutions. So institutional logics help us to understand how, how that kind of agency can happen within the sort of constraining environment of an institution. So that's why that's why we like it, that's why we use it. And that's why you, Joe, and I thought that it would be better to, um, to get a better understanding of how it's used in higher education. So at this point, I'm gonna hand back to you, Joe, who's going to talk to you about what we found when we investigated the use of these logics in higher education research. Thank you very much, Nicola, for the introduction of the institutional logic theory and why institutional logics are relevant to higher education. Now I'm going to present our findings regarding institutional logics analysis in higher education research. Our analysis reveals that the approaches, actually there are so many approaches that was a challenge initially for us as authors to handle the complexity. We found there are so many studies you know, using different approaches, but we found more or less later on, all these studies or approaches to institutional logic analysis in higher education research can be positioned on a two-dimension typology, uh, as I, I uh, illustrated here. So in the horizontal dimension, we distinguish two ways of identifying institutional logics that are respectively associated with inductive reasoning and deductive reasoning. We want to uh, zoom in the upper right. So if you look at the typology, the, the, the upper right. So this for this approach, we call societal level induction. Uh, actually for this uh, uh, approach, we, we didn't find any higher education studies fill in because you know, uh, actually this is the approach 
applied by those uh, authors of classic literature of institutional logic analysis. Through this approach, they have identified the eight idea type societal logics as mentioned by Nicola. Uh, so now uh, my focus is on the other three types. We will see how higher education researchers identify and apply institutional logics. Uh, for, instance, for instance, now we move on to the approach societal level deduction. So in this approach, uh, all the eight idea type societal logics proposed by the classic literature were applied. As shown in the figure, the most popular logics reported in higher education studies are market, profession, and state logics. Interestingly, these logics basically correspond to the three corners in Burton Clark's Triangle of Higher Education Coordination. This is a very famous in higher education studies. In general, studies applying such approach more strictly follow institutional logic theory and show methodological rigor. However, we found some challenges. First, the idea of hypothetical logics originally identified in the Western context may be limited in institutional analysis in non-Western countries. Second, even in higher education studies, in Western context, researchers still want to expand the framework of idea type logics by adding new ones. However, the newly added ones are often freely defined, or sometimes they are not societal level logics in a strict sense. In the second type, the, the approach of field level deduction, uh, instead of citing societal level logics as a template, the studies cite certain field institutional logic from other sources, mainly from uh, higher education studies and other organization studies uh, as a template to get their empirical analysis. Altogether, we found 18 such kind of logics applied in the literature we have reviewed. You may notice here profession, market, and state logic indicated by the purple color points. Uh, actually, they are basically the same logics we just mentioned on the societal level. Uh, however, they are treated here as field level logics because the authors cite field specific sources rather than the classic logic literature. So this is why we put these logics at the field level because they are not citing the classic literature. So indeed, institutional context of higher education is, is becoming increasingly complex. However, we still think 18 logics in the field of higher education might be too many. That can be a problem for researchers. Compared to a more well-defined idea type logics at the societal level, agreement is lacking on what idea type logics are at the field of higher education. With only a few exceptions, the formation of most idea type field level logics in higher education is difficult to trace. Uh, researchers have different interpretations of logics with the same name. Also, some logics with different labels share similar assumptions. In the next tab, the studies applying the field level induction approach analyze their empirical data without initial reference to previous identified institutional logics at either societal or field level. These studies often result in the modification or expansion of the range of logics in the field. Altogether, we found 30 new logics in the literature, so even more. We consider this approach, meaning a field level induction, is the most promising one, but at the same time, the most problematic. 
It's promising because it could provide a solid basis for identifying idea type logics in the field of higher education that can be potentially applied as analytical framework in empirical investigations. The approach is problematic because many of these logics are rather freely defined. And in some cases, the logics identified do not strictly follow the definition in the classic literature. Uh, for instance, uh, when institutional logics are understood as stakeholders' beliefs, academic disciplines, and the research excellence, there is a lake, also there is a risk of compromising the analytical or theoretical power of institutional logics as super organizational vocabularies of practice. And sometimes authors mix three concepts, namely institutional logic, ideology, and organization setting, which are interrelated but different in analysis. As a whole, we found, uh, although you know, all these studies combined to mention 50 logics, that's quite many logics. However, the number of logics applied in each individual study does vary. So too, that's the record with which each logic is defined. This may indicate a problem in the field of uh, institutional analysis in higher education called concept misformation, uh, including conceptual training and conceptual stretching. Conceptual training is a problem of too many logics, uh, too few logics, sorry. So if we agree eight logics are identified to other template, then there's no questions for empirical investigations. Conceptual stretching is about the problem of too many logics. That is the case in higher education studies. If logics become a particular organizational ingrained practices, sense of identity or sense of purpose, detached from a tight coupling with the societal institutions, then institutional logics become an empty concept in the field. So we are seeking something in between. Not too many, but we are not constrained by the eight ideal societal logics. Finally, I want to re remind uh, the, uh, the audience, uh, we found that it's possible that some of, the, some of the problem we have identified may reflect the fact that institutional logics um, somehow has been um, misunderstood or, you know, understood in a simple way. That means we sometimes, some researchers might forget institutional logics is only one of several branches of institutional theory. Institutional theory is powerful, but institutional theory has its, its limitations. So we would remind uh, the, uh, the scholars interested in institutional logic analysis also be aware of other branches of institutional theory, as uh, Nicola has already mentioned at the beginning. For example, if we want to understand how the logics will emerge, evolve, or become displaced in competing hybrid and blended logics, other kinds of institutional theory, for example, institutional entrepreneurship might be useful. Also, we should also be aware of the situation that there is a coexisting of the phenomenon of com competing logics and isomorphism. So we are sometimes struggling whether we are in the, in the phenomenon of isomorphism or institutional complexity. Actually, both may coexist. Uh, so this is my review of our uh, major findings uh, of with highlighting the challenges, uh, how we can resolve the problems of institutional logic analysis in higher education research. Now I invite Nicola to share our suggestions. 
Thanks, Eugenia. So, yeah, so maybe we'll just uh, take five minutes to um, think about what this means for us as researchers in higher education contexts um, and indeed those of us who are institutional uh, researchers, maybe outside of higher education, a lot of my own research is in the healthcare um, environment. And I suppose the first thing that we'd really like people to take away from this paper is that uh, we we really need a different like a, a clear differentiation between societal level um, analyses and field level analyses and I suppose we're asking that researchers would start to articulate within um, their write-ups and their analyses which level they're looking at and if they're working across multiple levels that's fine but but to be sort of clearer about that and, and what, what I suppose what emerged from the research um, that you just described is that often the, the kind of the, the more cultural um, elements come through in the societal level analysis and often researchers rely more on practice um, based uh, analyses um, at the field level and, and I suppose it, it's worth reminding uh, researchers that for for it not to be just a logic but rather to be an institutional logic and um, that there must be both cultural and practice uh, elements to it and i suppose we would recommend um, and we do recommend in the paper um, recourse to Thornton and Ocasio's kind of checklist, you know, that do identity, power, classification and attention, do they all stem from this thing that's being called an institutional logic or not? And, and really that, that they need to, we need to see those coming from it. Um, We'd also sort of recommend uh, more attention to the, the, the matching your method with the theory and thinking, I suppose, about levels of theory um, and then levels of logics and how those might intersect. So um, we look to and we, we write about in the paper Kazar's levels of theory, you know, going from meta theory to grand to middle level to um, low level theory. And, and we map that on to um, levels of logic. So the societal logic, you know, the field level logics, the organizational logics and understanding that that those levels on both sides are, are recursive, you know, that, that higher levels inform lower levels and lower levels inform higher levels. And, and what that leads us to is a recommendation that, that the best research, and I know it's not always possible, but the, the very best research will combine inductive and uh, deductive elements uh, to really sort of understand that recursive relationship between those levels of logics and then the levels of theory and, and how they come together and we discuss that more um, in the paper and um, but the final uh, piece that i really wanted to to talk about is something that isn't in in this paper but is something that uh Yujo and i've been working on and um, for another paper since and we've been looking at um both higher education and healthcare together and kind of looking at the use of logics in those and it's it's sort of emerged from this research that potentially we're not properly differentiating between ideologies on the one hand and and logics on the other, and that that might actually be very helpful in terms of disentangling um, and making sense of these these multiple, like you know, way too many logics that are emerging. And um, we propose in in this new paper that, that's under review that we look at um, logics as being kind of um, uh, more in you know offering more embeddedness and more structure um, and that really we're seeing them sort of inscribed historically at kind of field or societal levels um, and that they're more towards the abstract and symbolic um, uh, whereas the ideologies are more sort of like formulae for action you know and that we see them more inscribed at individual levels um, and we see sort of an active pursuit rather than you know a relatively passive embeddedness and I, I we're not going back to old institutional theory I think but uh, we're still you know we still see agency um but uh, but maybe that that's if we could distinguish ideologies um from logics from institutional logics we might get closer to um you know a, a recipe where we can sort of manage the number of institutional logics and and therefore 
build on each other's research rather than starting each piece of research from from scratch uh, with a new logic or new logics. And um, so, you know, we can then um, maybe talk a little bit more about that. But I, I'm conscious of time. I do want to leave time for questions. So um, with that, I think I'll bring this part of the the webinar to a close. Um, and thank you all for for your attention and invite you uh, to to ask any questions or make any comments and all welcome. Uh, and thank you. Uh, thank you, Eugene and, uh, and Nicola. I mean, that was pretty interesting. And I think you've opened up a discussion already with it. We've got five people coming in to the chat uh, and I'm going to call in Ron Barnett, Elizabeth Balbachevsky, Glenn Chatelia, Hongbui, uh, Celia Whitchurch in, in that order. And I'll give you warnings. Uh, each of you as your turn comes up. But let me ask a question at the start of our two presenters. Um, I mean, it's, reality is always more complex than our, our, the tools we use to try and understand it. So this is the great uh, joy of social science that we, you know, every so often we develop tools that theories and methods that help us move forward and open up new things for us. Now, how does institutional logic thinking, how does this framework help us understand the reality of higher education I mean, and as researchers. Can you perhaps give examples of how this approach has opened up particular empirical zones more effectively for us? And, and the second part of my question is about limitations. And I think you've started to answer this already. You know, what are the limitations of a institutional logic framework? You know, what, where where is it trapped? Where where do we need to go beyond it, perhaps? So, what does it enable, and what does it not enable? <laughs> this is my question. Big yeah, question. Yeah, uh, thank you. I think this is a very important question, Sam. I really appreciate. It. I think that's uh, basically uh, fundamental issues we have to uh, uh, respond if we are applying a theory. So, how is it useful? Maybe I start with the first part or first question, and Nicola, you can, of course, you can still comment on the same question, and then you respond to the second. Uh, uh, so far, I, th I think uh, you probably you know, need some examples because of our presentation is indeed you know, very abstract. So we, we try to use the time really to uh, 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 show the landscape. Uh, but I can give you a couple examples, simple examples, how institutional logics may help us. Uh, for, for example, one, one example uh, institutional logic is useful is to help us to understand uh, what are the complexity, because we often say, you know, it's very complex, it's, it's a very complex field, there's a lot of tensions, uh, but by identifying the logics, for example, if we, we say there is a market logic, professional logic, corporate logic, so we can somehow to make sense of the make sense of the tensions. And uh, so to make it more concrete, uh, but what's going beyond the complexity analysis is institutional uh, logics may to some extent help us to understand the, ten the change, not only the change, but the tendency of the change and how the changes you know, came from and where the changes were moved forward, you know, because uh, when we are linking the changes, you know, we have to, uh, to the logic, we have to put into the policy context. So logics are very important tools for understanding, for example, uh, higher education policy, especially the implementation. From the institutional logics perspective, a higher education policy is for introducing or inject some new logics. So if you know they want to break the, the, the current balance. So basically they want to introduce some, some logics. So if we do not see the logic perspective, uh, of course we can have a different interpretation, but the logic perspective can help, for example, if this reform had a strong, you know, a push for market logic or, you know, for a corporate, corporate logic or even for community logic, for example, I have now, uh, a project with my uh, one of my PhD student on open science. We also think that oh, oh, we also identify that you know among many things. So a community logic is very important, you know, in the policy discourse. So basically, policy the logics can make sense of many things, including complexity, 
and uh, policy implementation, the organizational changes, as well as organizations' strategies to cope with the tensions, how they manage this. But I do not want to uh, spend a too long time uh, to go to the concrete examples. But I, I welcome those who have this, the, the interest you know, to do read our paper. Beside the analysis, we list all the references as appendix. I think that's also very, very useful. If you want to see concrete examples, you can go to the appendix to find you know, the articles and to see how the authors use logics to do their analysis. I think I stop here. I uh, give the floor to uh, Nicola to respond to the second question. Yeah, I might just, if I may, I don't want to spend too much time on that question, but I might just add that um, I think from a practical perspective, um, institutional logics are very helpful, you know, in the, particularly when we're conducting qualitative research, they help us to organize our research results, you know, they give us a kind of a checklist against which to, uh, to, um, uh, to organize things and to sort of um, categorize statements and so on. And in doing so, I think they they challenge us to probe beneath um, the qualitative data and the statements. You know, they help us to sort of say, well, like, what is actually underpinning this statement? You know, this statement that um, you know I'm a professional and I shouldn't need to worry about the finances um, within my like, like, what's beneath that? What's underpinning that statement? Um, what is it resistant to? You know, what is it, what is it in pursuit of? Um, and I think the institutional logics approach uh, certainly helps me as a researcher uh, to do that. So um, you just wanted to, to add that. Um, but the, the, the second uh, question was around the limitations of the institutional logics framework. And um, I, I think, you know, I think really in, in many ways, the, the logics framework itself isn't limited if we accept that you know we can have uh, you know a fixed set of kind of relatively fixed set of societal logics but that we can add to those at field level and um, but what what limits it i think is the disparate ways in which we apply it um and i think we we jeopardize it by our sort of you know multiple um, methods of application and the sort of the the uh, absence of kind of cross-referencing and building on particularly the identification of field level logics, you know, because I've seen in, in healthcare research, for example, where that can work really, really well, where we've had, uh, for example, the identification of a care logic, um, you know, that really is linked to the institution of the doctor-patient dyad, um, and that that has really you know taken a root within healthcare research and is is commonly referenced as a logic and so people can people know what it means now they can build on it and so on that's not as clear in the higher education research i don't think i think we've been a little freer in the way we've defined new logics and i think that limits it because it starts to damage its credibility and its strength Thank you. Thank you very much for those interesting, fulsome answers. Um, we're, be, we're getting towards the, the, the two thirds of the way through the webinar. So I'm going to bring in Ron Barnett next, and then I think we'll start bunching questions, taking two at a time. So Ron has a question about the logic of logic, I think. <laughs> Thank you, yes, Simon. You've taken my words almost away from me. Um, I'm a very simple soul, and I'm, uh, this is all new to me. So just help me a little bit. If you would, please, um, I'm just struggling with the very notion of the term logic and wondering how you're using it here. Um, do you, are you using it metaphorically or does it have some particular meaning? And what, what does the term add, the term logic to, uh, uh, picking up on Simon's earlier question, what's it add to our vocabulary in, in higher education studies. Let me put this question to you. How can an institution have a logic? Um, and I'll just press that a bit more. Isn't, isn't it, couldn't it actually be misleading to talk of an institution having a logic and even dangerously misleading? Don't we in this complex world want to use other terms like complexity, contingency, multiplicity, non-rationality. In other words, institutions fundamentally do not have logics. 
Um, I think the I think the uh, start point is perhaps I, I completely agree, right? So we we need to be able to address all of those uh, the complexity and so on. The start point is possibly around the definition of institution rather than the definition of logic. So often when when non institutional theory uh, researchers talk about institutions and the general public speak about institutions, they're talking about you know a university is an institution, for example, or you know government is an institution and so on. Um, institutional theorists are far pickier about the way they use the term institution and um, they really hark back to these massive societal presences, you know, like church, state, market and so on. And so then when we talk about institutional logics, um, we're talking about not the institution having a logic itself, but people looking towards that institution as a guide for the way they behave. And so, you know, that that I, you know, if I have a market logic, that I I look to the market to 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 um, as a basis for the decision make for the way I act and the decisions that I make and the actions that I take. And um, so that become that institution becomes part of the logic by which I, I, I act and engage. And so um, the, I don't know whether that answers the question or not, but that's uh, like, I, I'm, I'm no institutional theory expert either. There's probably people in this room who know far more than I do, but that's certainly my understanding of it when, when I go to use it as a theory. Um, I don't know, you, Joe, whether I... I, I think I, you, you made, made it a point. I think uh, this is a very important question. So the best person to respond should be the originators of the yeah. <laughs> logic. I, I, suspect, but, uh, I suspect this could run for a while. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I think we need to move on, unfortunately, because I think it's quite an important question. It is. Uh, but yeah. there's a lot of people there um, that, that want to come in on different, and they've got different angles on, on, on your presentation. So yeah. let me bring in two people now, Elizabeth Belbachevsky and Glenn Cecilia. So hold your answer until you've heard both questions. So Elizabeth from pre-election Brazil, Elizabeth. Yeah, hello. Uh, thank you for th this presentation. It is very interesting. I was wondering if we could, for instance, to to understand agency of actors inside an institution using the institutional logic as a, an instrument in, inside their fights uh, for changing the institution. I was thinking about, you know, that there is a guy from uh, international relations study that, that framed the concept, framed the concept of um, uh, rhetoric action and he said that it's very interesting how actors even if they are not really convinced of this of the reality of some ideas some values they use these uh, these values this logic this institutional logic let, let's let us say uh, in in, in, inside the fights for changing a policy, uh, uh, the certain as aspects of the institution, something like that. I, I would like to, to, to hear about this idea. Thanks, Elizabeth. Good to see you in the webinar. Um, Glenn Chatelia. Glenn. Uh, thank you, um, Simon, and uh, thanks to both. Uh, presenters. I mean, you guys just knocked our socks off, so to speak. Thank you. Um, my question really has to do with uh, a, a shift in institutional logic, given the COVID pandemic uh, that we all are currently experiencing, even in the Omicron strains, for example. And that is, uh, has, has your study really addressed the market uh, logic, uh, more specific to entrepreneurial logic, okay? Because that seems to me to be a kind of driving force in institutions in Southeast Asia, which I represent uh, this evening, I believe, okay, from Assumption University. And, and uh, the thing is this, I've been grappling with a couple of colleagues on how we could bring 
my university into conversation with other universities to get beyond the constraints of the pandemic, but to look at the markets of the future, not just for the profits, but also for the training, the human resources. And therefore, I'm asking you in your studies, did you ever uh, in, in your research, did you come across any tendencies towards the entrepreneurial kind of direction, not just the market, but the entrepreneurial direction? Uh, it would help if, if you could answer this so that I might take it back to my experts and then say, boy, we've got something to grow on. Thank you. And thanks, Glenn. Uh, now you've got two questions there, colleagues, and uh, keep an eye on the time because we are moving on. It's now... Um, 12 minutes before the hour. So maybe respond, each respond to one or respond briefly to both. You wanna go first, TJ? Okay, so uh, probably I can uh, respond to Elizabeth. Uh, thank you for raising the question. I know you, Elizabeth, you are coming from the, the background of uh, political science. So uh, you are interested in the power agency. So it's understood, understandable. Uh, I, I think uh, logics, I do have a paper uh, about the agency, you know, analyzing the agency role of actors in higher education by using institutional logics. Uh, however, lo the institutional logics alone cannot explain everything. So that's also related to the limitations as Simon mentioned. I think uh, institutional logic for any series has its, uh, you know, Basically, power, but the but it's powerful only for explaining certain issues, not everything. Uh, when we are understanding the agency, of course, there's also other things like you know power games, interest. I think uh, uh, by only using institutional logic, you cannot understand all the factors. However, institutional logic can supplement existing theories uh, to deeper and analyze the agency, especially for for it from the institutional change perspective. If you want to zoom in how the power games uh, or the, how the agency leads to institutional change, how, how the institutional environment has changed, then logics will help to make things more concrete because you can identify what are the institutional contexts, what are the logics there, what are changing, you know, which is down, which is up, and what are the tensions, then you can link the institutional analysis with some other issues like interest, power game, etc. Uh, so now I, I give the and then maybe and um, so uh, I, I think that's a really interesting question from Glenn. And um, so I, I haven't uh, done research around COVID uh, myself and institutional logics, but I would just say from uh, you know from living in and working in an, um, a third level institution. I would actually say that the market logic has potentially become less prevalent um, due to COVID and that things like community logics and if I can borrow from healthcare, the care logic um, are maybe uh, um, becoming more, uh, more evident in, certainly in my institution as we try to look after students and um, hopefully look after colleagues as well. And that's become more important than, you know, getting them in, churning them out um, than it had been in the past. Um, but I think possibly what you're also talking about is, is institutional entrepreneurship itself, you know, and how we um, shift the, the boundaries of institutional logics or challenge logics that might constrain us from doing things that we would see as entrepreneurial. Um, and I am involved in um, a, an EU project that is looking at um, changing doctoral education and trying to educate institutional entrepreneurs um, within our PhD student population. And we can certainly talk more about that offline if you're interested. Thank you for your responses. And let me bring in Hong Bui at this point. And I'll also be asking on Celia Whitchurch as well, but Hong Bui first. Yeah, thank you very much, Simon and Nicholas and Jukes for your presentations. Um, it's really uh, interesting and insightful. I've learned a lot. And Nicholas has mentioned about the uh, integrating inductive, inductive design using this kind of theories. So my question here is, is not only for you, but might be uh, for Simon as well, because Simon is the editor of a, uh, one of the most famous um, journals in higher education. But, you know, hedge journals often limits around seven to 8,000 words. <laughs> How could we integrate mixed methods 
into that uh, kind of paper, you know, in a partnership. So I'm sorry, Simon, but I, I have to take you in. Okay, uh, I'm not quite clear on the question, Hongbi, but um, okay. maybe our, our, our speakers are doing better than I am. Um, can we bring in Celia and then we'll test whether that question was comprehensible. Celia. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, I really enjoyed the presentation and brings up some practical issues that certainly I, I've been thinking about as somebody who researches the academic profession and also as a past journalist editor. It's increasingly difficult now um, to do large scale studies, partly because of funding, partly because of difficulty of bringing in different national contexts. Um, and it struck me that it, um, I've read a number of small scale studies recently, which um, tend to be less, um, less regarded by, in, by uh, journals and journal editors, but in fact can be very, very useful um, on the qualitative uh, side of things. Um, but it strikes me that maybe these large theories do lend themselves more to large scale studies. And I just wondered uh, if you th thought that the, um, sorry, the, fi the field approach or the field logic tends to be used more in small scale studies and the societal, societal logic in larger scale studies. Um, so I, I just thought there's, there is quite a difference between the two. Okay, scale of study. And do you okay. need Hong to Hong Wei to come back again with her question, or are you no. comfortable? I, I think I'm. If if you're okay with it, you join. I might deal with the first one and mm -hmm. you do the second one. Um, and yeah, yeah. so, um, Hong Wei, I I don't know what uh, um discipline you're coming from. What what? I'm from management. From management. Okay, so then you be familiar, presumably, with the Joya method. Um, of. Uh, analyzing data and I think that's more what we're talking about here it's not so much doing two separate pieces of research you know qualitative and quantitative it's more about going through phases of analysis of your data and um, taking perhaps an inductive um, phase where you just let the data speak and you you know you you see what patterns are emerging and combining that uh, with a deductive phase where you take the existing logics, whether they be societal or field level, and you check those against what you're finding so that you're not creating new logics, uh, new logics that maybe already exist somewhere else, but that, that this kind of um, combination of deductive and inductive analysis gives us a stronger basis. So it doesn't really require a whole load of new data, it just um, we see. Yeah. So, so, so I missed your point about deductive and inductive. But no, he, no, I did. I, yes. I didn't embroider on it. So you're you're right to ask the question. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. That's very good. Thank you. Yeah. yeah so thank you, Nicola, for the clarification. I think uh, sometimes we have to see things in the in the context. You know, the deductive inductive can refer to mixed method, but also we are talking about the traditions in qualitative research. But I think you mentioned, I think uh, Hong Biu and uh, Celia mentioned quite an quite a important issue for every researcher. I think I also share the concern. So even though I'm not doing mixed method research, if I try to combine you know, the, the deductive, uh, inductive reasoning, even in the qualitative research, or even I engage more complicated analytical framework, for example, institutional logic, which is quite abstract, but when you are applying it, it's not very straightforward, then you really need to build a logic chance how you can apply a higher level theory to a lower level practice. Then you need a longer time you know, uh, explanation. Then that's where practically we end up with a very long paper. So that might be a challenge. Even for me, you know, I often constantly, constantly facing the challenge where I can publish my paper if it's more than you know, 9,000 words, even though I want to send it to higher education, studies in higher education, but they are very strict with the, with the lens. I think both of you has uh, addressed this kind of challenge and uh, which are concern of many researchers, including me. So I'm not sure if Simon want to comment as an editor of higher education. That's what I want. Colleagues, we're running out of time. Can you briefly answer Celia's question then? I want to try and bring in a couple more people before we close. Yeah, 
I, I think probably, you know, I can, I think I some, somehow has already reflected, you know, how to manage, you know, very uh, complicated uh, researchers, you know, with, with limited resources and, uh, you know, the, the limited places for funding the outlet of publication. I think uh, somehow, uh, I do not want to uh, comment more and probably we can save the time. Maybe people also want to hear your response, uh, Samuel. Okay, um, at this point, I think I'll like to bring in the last batch of questions. We usually run to about five past, so we can we can run a bit longer. Uh, Palak uh, Sheth is our first question. Palak. Hello, Palak. Have we lost you? Okay, so we we may have done so. Let's move to Gaoming. Gaoming Jin, can you come in, please? Yes, thanks, Sam. And uh, I, thanks for you, Joe and Nicola, for the uh, very interesting research and very insightful uh, findings. Um, I have a question regarding about when we understanding and using logics. Uh, because I think it's very uh, important that you point out that when we try to use institutional logics, we cannot neglect its cultural insights. And, and, but when I'm using also institutional logics, sometimes it quite confuses me that when we really consider the cultural insights and considering our world, the, that the culture has so many diversities. So how, how to do the balance? Like for example, if we really consider the cultural diversity, maybe we will come up with more concepts of logics in the end and how to define whether it's a new logics or it's just an, a variance of logic in a certain culture or context. So how to make this kind of balance to keep like the validity or the reliability of the institutional logics, why we still can consider its cultural diversities. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Gaming. Um, Yu Yang He, can you come in please with your question? Yes, Hello? sure. Yeah, good. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. good. Thank you. Actually, I am a master's student, so I may be having a very stupid or even a naive question. I'm um, really looking for a, an example of how to apply the uh, institutional logics theory into, um, into practice, how to collect the necessary data to prove um, the, the, the logics or the theory in a very uh, a specified context. Um, because I am still a student, I may not have the direct contacts to the uh, high level people like the policymakers or the university presidents, because I'm um, focusing on the um, university un um, policies. So I'm really looking for an example, just uh, this is a very simple question. Maybe can you recommend some papers or even your own works to use as an example or a guide? Thank you so much. Okay, my um, speaker information is telling me that was Gao Ming. Uh, and I'm looking now for, uh, for Yu Yan. Yu Yan He, are you there? Yes, yes. I'm just um, talking about my question. Have you heard uh, it? Yeah, I, I heard. Uh, so maybe I can Thank quickly, uh, quickly respond to. Uh, uh, Yu Yang, uh, you can, as I said, you know, you go to the article uh, we show on the slides. Uh, in the article, we have an appendix of all the articles we have reviewed. So any article is a good example, so you can check. We have for, uh, over 50 articles, 50 examples. And for Gomi's question, maybe I can start, uh, Nicola can supplement. So I do not have a ready answer actually to Gomi's question. Basically, that is uh, you know the, 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 the struggles we are facing. Uh, to me, you know what we what we need to resolve the, uh, the this challenge to find a good way to balance you know the diversity and also you know the rigor of uh, institutional analysis to pursue a methodological solution. So now we are just applying institutional logics without, you know, agree the methodological approach. I think we do need some methodological approach agreed and also 
we need a good definition. We need to follow some definition. If we are referring anything to logic that that's basically a problem, we cannot communicate with each other. Basically, we are talking about different things, even, even though we say logic. That's also some part related to Ronald's question, you know, very essential. What is logic? Thanks, Xu Xiao. Um, I don't know whether you want to add anything, Nicola. I've now been able to find Palak Sheth. So, Palak, would you like to come in with your question? Hello, Palak. Uh, yes. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Yeah. yeah. No, I wanted to just have a small uh, request that if you have a case study or a paper presented where this institutional logic have been applied, is there any uh, uh, any research paper or case study that you can share with us, which we can really see that how this has been implemented and what are the kind of suggestions have been given to the institution based on the study, which has helped them to get improved? Thanks, Palak. Um, and I think we're now getting to the stage where this is final response. Um, so. I think each of you perhaps should say something and then we'll be able to close. I'm sorry we've had so many communication difficulties today, but it's been such a strong webinar in terms of content that we've got through and there's been a lot of interest. So over to our presenters. Um, I think probably Alec, that the question is, is similar to the one you just answered in that the paper has the list of all the reviewed papers in it. So there's a, um, a massive mine of examples of, of how institutional logics have been used. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, um, yeah, and uh, for you, and I was just going to say that, um, you know, you can look to documents um, as well as interviews. So, you know, you can find data within the published documents from the university that might help you to start anyway. And then you can question people about how they're experiencing those perceived or intended uh, logics on the ground um, and then in terms of Gao Ming I was just going to say in terms of the cultural diversity that's exactly the stretching straining balance um, uh, that, that we speak about in the paper trying to allow for this diversity while keeping the concepts you know comparable and relatable across papers and um, that's really uh, mopping up um, and <laughs> uh, really I, I suppose just to say thank you very much for all the uh, for all of the uh, time and the questions. And I'm very happy to be contacted by email by anybody who'd like to take it further. Thanks, Nicola. I think, Yuxiao, you've got the last word. Uh, thank you. I, I just want to uh, thank you for the opportunity. I'm so happy to see so many participants interested in institutional logic analysis. So we are just, you know, uh, in the very beginning stage of applying institutional logic. So let's work together. So I'm very happy to uh, communicate with you. If you have interest, drop me an email. So I would be happy to, to further discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Simon, for the arrangement and invitation. Uh, thanks, Yushio uh, and Nicola, for such a successful um, webinar. Uh, you know, such a strong presentation and occasioned a lot of discussion. I think you still have the, the challenge of Ron's question, what's what's logic to think about? Because, you, you know, you're, you're talking about institutions. So I think maybe thinking about logic is could be very, very helpful as well. Um, let's um, look forward to seeing everyone on Thursday, where we have Kaishin Ju, who's going to talk to us about patents and dynamics in the international research collaborations between China and UK in the field of education studies. So China, a persistent continuing interest in our webinar program, the rise of China, the importance of China, the new, new kid on the block, if you like, as amongst the great powers of, of research and science. Uh, and uh, now the discussion about relations between China and the West, which is also a great continuing interest for us. And in the field of education studies, and the focus on UK, China. So tune in for Kaishin Yu. Uh, I hope everyone who is in today to talk about institutional logics will be in on Thursday. And we look forward to seeing all of you later on in our webinar program. Remember, if you want to develop your own webinar, you're most welcome to do so. Um, send, send a proposition on the webinar content to me and we'll discuss it. And um, you know we don't accept everything, but we, run things through a test in terms of uh, content relevance and uh, and intellectual rigor but um you know we really do welcome suggestions from anywhere uh for uh, webinars related to higher education studies in our program 
thanks to our presenters again and thanks to you all for participating bye for now <laughs>